hello hello cringe crew music podcast series number two in the series we are listening to and reviewing the band's entire discographies uh currently going through the wonder years discography we are on oh boy it's it, it's been a hot minute I, I don't remember what number album we're on i know the name of it but I, do, I don't know what number it is ted is telling me it is album number four uh so yeah this one's called the greatest generation and this will conclude the little trilogy that we've been going through that includes uh suburbia i've given you all and the upsides as well this will be the conclusion of that trilogy um any anything important you think we should know about this one um this one feels a little bit more like a concept album than the last couple um only because i think that there is a continuity between songs from beginning to end uh which we'll definitely cover on the last track um it's it's definitely an album that is intended to be listened to straight through rather than taking individual tracks like the last couple um i also feel like as you mentioned the trilogy mike it's more loosely related to the first two where the first two were like very clearly a partnership uh th this belongs there kind of but it's not quite to the same extent okay um let's see this one is 13 tracks long just under 50 minutes uh track number one they're there all right um i <laughs> i'm only saying this because i was uh not so long ago editing videos for radiohead where uh there were a whole bunch of like mulled through syllables that you couldn't necessarily understand as words uh in, in the last verse when he says in mid-july it just kind of sounds like uh -huh, uh -huh. um <laughs> he does it twice um so we're, we're we're on theme for for what we're doing for this podcast um i i think the the thing that comes immediately to mind is they sink right into that like awkwardness social outcast kind of thing that came through in the last few albums but it's at a much higher production value um it's pretty short it's pretty cut and dry it gets right to it um not a lot of symbolism not a lot of like poetry that we saw in the last couple um it's it's just pretty straightforward about how soupy's feeling this time and i i think this is a good start so yeah so far this is probably one of my favorite like songs to have that they have campbell's vocals I really, really, really like the vocals on this. He doesn't seem like he's struggling. He doesn't seem like he's trying too hard. He just seems like he's singing. He's doing it, like, from the heart. Um, I, I also don't know if, I, if I'm happy or sad that I didn't know this album when it came out. Because uh, I don't know if I wanted to just be the... the uh, well, actually, Wonder Years in general. Because just about every other song and album they make, I'm like, hey, that's me. Wait till the next track. It God hurts. fucking damn it. I wasn't planned to hurt. <laughs> um, yeah, I I actually like this one. Um, I, I do like that it's, you know, pretty simple. Not that I... Not that I have an issue when, like, songs get really poetic and you have to, like, think real hard about it. But I appreciate when it, like, gets straight to the point and it's... You know, I, I appreciate that sometimes. Um, instrumentally, this is like kind of chill. You can kind of vibe to it, you know. Um, and yeah, I, shit, he just like me for real. <laughs> I'm telling you, just wait till the next one, bro. Oh, boy. Um, but uh, yeah, off, off to a good start, I think. Yeah. All right. Track number two, Passing Through a Screen Door. Um, I, so I, I want to point out one lyric in particular, as I mentioned in the last one that this was going to hit different, uh, Jesus Christ, I'm 26. All the people <laughs> I graduated with, I'll have kids, I'll have wives, I'll have people who care if they come home at night. Jesus Christ, did I fuck up? This song hit when I was 17 and this album came out. This song hit at 26 from the album. The lyrics were relevant. This song still fucking hits, dude. Um, I I think that this one kind of sets the tone for that that trilogy theme, Mike, in the idea that like the upsides was about life is shit, but I don't want to feel bad about it. Then then suburbia was about 
even when things are positive, I'm struggling to see it. And this one is, things were good. This is the happiest I've been. I can't be happy, and now I feel alone. And, and it's kind of about his love life, right? As we'll get into a couple of times in this album. And it, 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 this one strikes a fucking chord with me. It always has. I, I, this is probably a top five song for me of all time, Wonder Years or otherwise. Like, I, I adore this. This hits home every single time. It's a song that, like, if you're ready to be sad, you can listen to the lyrics and be sad. If you're ready to just jam musically, it's kind of upbeat. It gives you, gives you a good vibe. Like, there, there's a lot going on here, but I absolutely adore this song. Ted. Yeah, fuck you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks for making me feel shit again. <laughs> totally didn't block that off for a while there. <clears throat> um, this is this is a really good song. I, you know, if 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 Soupy's vocals were, were like, if I enjoyed him in the last song, I enjoyed him even more on this song. You can feel the emotion. You can hear everything he is trying to say and trying to convey with the lyrics. Um. Yeah, all around, they just sound sanely, like, <clears throat> well-produced. <laughs> um, so all I have to say about this is, you're feeling this at 26, I turn 28 next month. Brother, he just like me for real. Yeah. Knocking on 30's door. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Anyway, uh, track number three, We Could Die Like This. Um, I, I want to start by referencing a point that Conley made a couple of times about Soupy's vocals. Um, I think in the last three albums, we kind of just heard Soupy do whatever he wanted vocally, like not really caring about his range. Um, and I think this one is definitely like the high notes are Soupy's high notes. They're not necessarily high notes. The, the low notes are in Soupy's register, and I think it makes the whole sound much more clean. Um, I, I also like the, the genius annotation does a really go good job at pointing this out. The, the end of the chorus is if I die, I want to die in the suburbs. And I think it's a, a really big step that like we've turned into when I die or wanting to die or whatever, and turning it to if I die, where it's, it's, it's a, an idea that you want to keep going. And after the last two albums, I think that's like a huge step forward, like for what the sound is going for, what the vibe is. Uh, also, I can't walk away from this without saying that Soupy is a Birds fan confirmed. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna make a comment about it, but then I realized that was three years before you were born. I was like, hmm, I don't know if Ted gives a shit about the '92 Birds. Um, this, oh, good God, I, I, uh, yeah, Soupy's voice sounds really fucking good. It's not like his highs are trying to be like him cracking his voice to hit that shit. Uh. He's not, he's not really trying to like his screaming. Or his like his louder projections really good. Um, I don't have much else to say. This is a really good one. I love the the repetitions. Really good. Um, yeah. Uh, so far, not nothing really bad to say about any of the tracks. I mean, we're only we're only three in, so it it certainly does have an opportunity to not be as good as it's been. But yeah, nothing really too negative to say. Um. Yeah. Good. All right. Track number four Dismantling Summer. Um, I, I, I think this song is pretty significant in the idea that, like, we've been hearing about Soupy's life and how sad he is. And even when he's happy, he's sad and, and all this stuff for, for three albums now. Right. And, and, this one is the first time that, like, there's actually mention of, like, a real sad event. Not to belittle anything that he's felt up until this point, of course, right? But it's the idea that, like, this is the happiest time of my life and I can't do anything that I want to do because I'm worried about my grandfather in the hospital kind of thing. Um, I think there's some really, like, solid imagery here. Uh, I, I think that the pain, the, the suffering, the fear is all there. Um, and musically, I also want to give credit to Mike Kennedy because I think the drums in this song, like, are notably his best work thus far through four albums. Um, I, I, I think it's a good song. It's just not one that you can go back and listen to easily because it's like, who wants to listen about dead grandpas, you know? 
yeah, Ted. Um, I'm gonna need to go fuck yourself again. You're uh, welcome. This time a little harder though because uh, 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 I didn't expect to feel shit today, Ted. You gotta give me a warning. <laughs> uh, good fucking god. Uh, this is the last time I'll mention it, just because I'm sounding like a broken record. Um, I love Sloopy's vocals on this. It's so good. It sounds almost like someone who's been doing pop punk vocals for like 20 or 30 years. It's like perfected the not necessarily like a formulaic sound, but perfected the quintessential pop punk sound, I'd say. Um, really fucking good. And I hope I never listen to this song again. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that this is like a really good song but like you said yeah it it, i feel like the subject matter on it is like too personal for you to just like put it on casually like unless you're just planning to listen to the album like front to back like you're not just gonna pick this one to listen to and throw it in like you're driving around playlist or something right um but yeah um i was gonna say something else but i completely like forgot what i was gonna say it'll probably come back to me by the time the next song's over we'll see if it does i'll mention it because i i, I think it, it it has nothing to do with the song itself it was like some comment i wanted to make about the band or something i forgot i'll try to remember it uh we'll see anyway uh track number five the bastards the vultures the wolves I'm waking up. i uh this one just doesn't hook me like the rest of this album does. Like, I think it's one of the more forgettable tracks start to end. And I think it's saying something because, like, this is still a good song. It arguably would have been a better track on one of the past two albums. Um, but I think just the quality that we've heard so far from all the other songs, like, this one's just kind of easy to lose track of and kind of feels like a placeholder at the end of the day. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably have to agree on that. It's it's not bad by any stretch. It's still really, really good. Uh, I, I guess, though, when you compare, like, what you might consider a 9 or a 10, and then you see, like, a 7, I mean, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just, it's lower than what you just saw. Um, this is still good. Mike Kennedy is doing fucking God's work on the drums. Um, you can also tell that they significantly, I don't know, well, maybe not significantly. They, they've definitely maybe gotten better at songwriting, I'd say. Seems to be a lot of good flow, a lot of good rhythm. Just overall, that that's improved leaps and bounds, especially since like their first album. Yeah, I, I kind of like half remembered what I was what I was trying to say after the last song. Um, you can definitely tell that they've improved like significantly, especially since the first album, and even like a bit since I'd say even the second album. There's, I'd say that the songs are pretty consistent in their quality and that they're they're pretty good up at this point there are some that are i'd say like very slightly better than the other ones and some that are of course gonna be slightly worse than some of the other ones and yeah this is this is one like you said it's not a bad track at all it's just not as good as the other ones up up to this point right but again still still a good song there there's there's some consistency here with the quality a little bit it like yeah uh track number six the devil in my bloodstream uh here here's the warning to the both of you conley for your um, emotions um <laughs> and then uh it, the song is going to start out super quiet it is going to get louder don't turn your volume up or you're deaf in yourself okay <sighs> so crank it gotcha i mean <laughs> by all means i better be a fucking child. So we're halfway back to the symbolism, uh, but then there's also some pretty straightforward lines in there. Like, the depression grabbed his throat and choked the life out of him slowly. Not not so veiled. Um, I, I really like the way this song transitions. And the, the slow, sad, depressed piano kind of like melancholy vibes into the theme of the album as the song picks up and, and not feeling strong enough to fight the day. And I, I think like everything about this song just kind of hits its own vibe. The, the tone they set is the perfect one at every moment in time. The transition is really good. Um, I, 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 I really like this song, but similar to a couple of songs ago, Mike, like you said, the subject matter just seems kind of 
too personal to to sit, you know, put it on your driving playlist to just chill out and listen to. Um, it, it's it's certainly fitting with that theme of hitting the entire album all at once. It's more of a concept album rather than individual tracks. Um, Ted, you already know what I'm gonna say, so I'll just skip it. Um, I, I love that in that verse you told me the only two lines in Genius that are not annotated are the two that are so un so blatant that it's just hey <clears throat> i'm gonna write out exactly what the fuck happened you don't need to annotate this shit i promise like that's just that's hilarious to me um i don't have anything else to say from the the piano and the like additional percussion the beginning is really really nice it's really moving uh that transition is very abrupt and i mean that's i'm assuming you know his point <laughs> it's it's a very good song i, I like this one a lot also, something I'd like to say is that I noticed, or I'm not sure if I noticed, but there, there's so many goddamn times that the Wonder Years places some lyric or, like, the name of a song from, like, any of the last, like, three albums. And I'm like, oh, hey, Genius told me that's, that's a name of a song. I would not have remembered that. Thanks, Genius. Yeah, even though, like... No, no shot in hell. I'd remember that. I'm glad that somebody else did and pointed it out for me on genies.com. So thank you for that. Um, I'd also like to say that, like, even though there there are some songs where, like, yeah, the subject matter is too personal or like the song is like too sad to like throw on your car playlist. I'd like to say that I am an insane person and put entire <laughs> albums on my driving playlist. Oh, yeah. And you will catch me in my car listening to Pyramid Song by Radiohead, tears in my <laughs> eyes, fucking jam into that shit. I don't care. Um But yeah, this this is um He just like me for real. <sighs> That's all I have to say about that. Um, all, no, actually, I lied. I have one additional thing to say about that. Um, I cranked up my volume anyway because nobody tell me what to do, <laughs> and I am not deaf. It was not as loud as as was going to be advertised. Um, listen, if you listen to the album off a physical medium, it deafens you. Even if you turn <laughs> your volume down, it's deafening. YouTube didn't do me justice either. I have. I I straight up downloaded the thing. And it, listen, it, it, was, it was the same volume. It was just, oh, now there's guitars now. Listen, man. All I'm saying is it deafens you when you listen to it off of physical media. That's all I know. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, track number seven, Teenage Parents. I really like this song because it's it's a good combination of the like the relics of his past as we've talked about his family members and other songs right and and the way that they succeeded and and it kind of feels hopeful in the idea that like well if they succeeded despite all this dumb shit like maybe i can too and it kind of feels like finding a home amidst all the feeling of not belonging that we've gotten from all the other songs um may maybe i'm reading too far into that and and it's just the upbeat vibe of the song but i i definitely think that this this feels kind of fitting to a couple of different themes we've gotten through the album um it's another one that you probably wouldn't listen to just as a standalone song but it's it's good it's upbeat at least this one gives you a more positive vibe than my grandfather's dying and and i think that's that's something positive for this one over other singles yeah, I mean, I guess you also can only be so positive about, you know, being a teenage parent, so. Um, they're very interesting for the title. Uh, I really liked a lot of Mike Kennedy's work on this album, and in particular this song. I just stood out a lot for me. Um, <clears throat> I'll say that... Um, what's it? I, was, I fucking had something here. Um... Soupy loves the fucking 90s. He, he really likes talking about the 90s. First it was the birds of 92, now the winter of 93. Is he just going to go along the line? Are we going to get something in 94 now? Well, okay. The, the, <laughs> listen, both of those things had very specific years for a reason. Oh, I know. Jerome, I know. Jerome Brown died in 92. I know. The winter of 93 was a catastrophic blizzard across the Northeast. <laughs> 
<laughs> like it's relevant, even if he was too young to remember and he loves the 90s. What? I'm not saying you're wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying they're very specific references. I wonder what's going to happen in 94. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like the annotation under um, Cape Cod on a busy street that just says, this yes. is a Cape Cod for those who don't know, which included me two minutes ago. <laughs> Love that. Love that. that. I, I also, also, I really want to know, what, what the fuck is his, 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 his Soupy's fucking saying of naive? Was I right? It sounded like he said nev. What? Where? I, I didn't catch what? that. Verse one, you said you were strong and naive. I I think it kind of like blends in with the music a little bit, like the guitars kind of drown it out. Like it, it he definitely says naive, but it's very easy to get blended. Mm. Okay. Oh, uh oh. Um, Discord. OBS. Uh, uh, OBS capture Discord. Uh, please? Okay, we're good. Uh, okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I just, I just wanted to point out the uh the genius verse. Um, but yeah, uh, we, ooh, I think, yeah, we're, we're about halfway through now. Uh, track number eight, Chaser. I didn't realize until I'm listening to this as like one YouTube video where I'm pausing in between songs that the outro to every single song is an <laughs> 18 second long sustained guitar mm -hmm. note. Uh, get your shit mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think this song may not necessarily be the same kind of powerful that other tracks on this album are, but I think this one is certainly more listenable and approachable as a single that you might put on your your Spotify playlist or whatever, right? Um, I I think that the the imagery is still there and feeling like you don't belong and all of that, right? Like, it's it's right on cue, but I think it's just more simple and approachable and, and not necessarily as, like, punch you in the teeth kind of powerful. It's a good one. It's among my favorites on the album, but it, it, it's pretty simple comparatively. Uh, yeah, I love that as not just not just with Wonder Years, but almost any band, the further you go in the album, the less annotations people seem to make on the song. Like this is number eight it has two point eight million view or listens on Spotify. And there are two annotations and one of them isn't even the entire line and it's just pointing out an easter egg <laughs> sometimes they will annotate the entire song and then times people don't give a fuck um this one was really fun honestly the, the the wonder years does a really good job of maybe less so in this song but does a really good job of making music that is very fun and fast-paced and then writing songs that make me want to fucking cry, you asshole. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is this is a really good one. Uh, I guess I'm a colossal forehead because I, I really wish there were annotations because I spent a majority of the song trying to figure out what the fuck he's talking about. But I, I guess I'm just dumb. I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I do I do appreciate the the little Easter egg there calling back to that. Uh, the booth at the the diner that they eat at very cool um yeah I, I, the song was okay but i i guess i'm just dumb i don't know <laughs> track number nine an american religion uh also in quotations fsf which i'm being which i'm reading stands for fuck school forever So uh, th this is the turning point in the album where it starts to become a little bit self-indulgent. Um, we, we talked about it a bit with Radiohead in particular, where they started to have like entire songs dedicated to I don't know how to handle fame. Um, and this one certainly like comes to that conclusion where it's like not being OK with media or interviews or whatever. Um, but the, the line that really gets to me that like, may, maybe we should calm down a step is Truman will always be remembered for dropping a bomb. <laughs> I'll be remembered for my fuck ups. I promise no one is thinking about you saying the wrong thing to, to Kerrang magazine as the same as Truman dropping a <laughs> nuclear bomb in Hiroshima. Okay. I promise you're going to be okay. Soupy. Um, I, I, I do think that like the, like the mostly through the lyrics through this song are are pretty consistent right in in the idea that like 
you know, not feeling comfortable with the spotlight and feeling like you're you're under pressure and still not feeling like there's a sense of belonging or not feeling like you're important enough to have those things happen to you. Like, I, I think the message is there. I, I think it just gets a little bit self-indulgent for me. Um, yeah, I, I think that that, that might be two of my favorite lines in, in a song, just period. The fact that the Wonder Years referenced Truman in a song is that was not on my bingo card uh, for anything <laughs> that that was not on there um this one's this one is also i think like the shortest song on the album or yeah i think it's the shortest song on the album um mm. i there, there might be shorter yeah yeah they're pretty close it seems there i really really love the fast pace of it uh i guess you could say maybe i mean it, the song's still aggressive so maybe you can't say that the lyrics are adjacent to that but um this is a really good one and i actually thought i think this is a lot of fun um boy what a what a comparison huh calm down dude it's it's not that serious chill out <laughs> like you could you could have compared it to anything but i think i think that's a little much um <laughs> Yeah, th this is a this is a good one. Um, more more Easter eggs in here as well. Um, still living in Richie's basement. Uh, that's a throwback to uh, a previous song, uh, and I think the line right after that uh, is as well. Um, yeah, this is a good one, and yeah, was was not expecting the <laughs> the Truman line. Incredible. <laughs> Track number 10, A Rain Dance in Traffic. Another fucking 20 second guitar <laughs> sustained note outro. Get your shit together. Um, I, this one leaves nothing on the table as far as symbolism goes. Like the, the opening line is, I'm fantasizing about doing a rain dance in traffic. Like th there is there is nothing being hidden here. Um I, I think this one's pretty cut and dry. Uh, if you go through the lyrics, it's it's it comes as advertised, right? Um, but I I do want to say that for the genius annotations, like this was very clearly written by an Eagles fan because they said I used to have such steady hands. Now I can't keep them from shaking, and they used a picture of Wes Welker dropping a football. Like they they just <laughs> fuck the Patriots, go Burns. <laughs> and I, it was just so out of place and unnecessary. But it's very clear that like an Eagles fan wrote this. I love that on that same annotation, the title of it is another world-class line from Soupy. Like, that is obviously this person's <laughs> favorite line in the whole goddamn song. Oh, my God. This, yeah, this, this... I just kind of want to know, why the fuck does every single song end in just the guitar? Why? Just, uh, why? Um, yeah, there is... I mean, I don't know what else I can really say about it. It's, it's, it is pretty straightforward. <laughs> Even a dummy like me can understand. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, I, again, like pretty consistent with the other tracks and nothing really incredible about it. It's, it's solid. It, it's consistent. Yeah. Um, not really anything negative to say so far. Um, three tracks left to go. Um, is good. All right, track number 11, Madeline. All right, as much as I love this album, uh, this song is an instant skip. It's boring, mm -hmm. it's slow, it's stupid. I hate this song. Um, one thing that I would like to note, not necessarily related to, to this one in particular, um, so, uh, Madeline is actually like a real person in Soupy's life. Uh, her, her name isn't actually Madeline, but when he wrote the song, he used Madeline to fit the tempo of the song and also to protect her identity, which he's said in a more recent album that he regrets it, that he wish he could just title it to her. Um, <laughs> But um, this song comes up again. He basically uses this as a concept to rewrite a song or rewrite a new song that's in their most recent album at the time of this recording, um, which I find pretty fascinating. Like, I, I appreciate the fact that, like, he can keep the people in his life worth writing a song about consistent enough to write to them again later. I, I, I think this is a pretty cool jumping board for that. But this song blows. 
Uh, so I, I don't say that I hate this song, but it, it's definitely one that I'll listen to once and probably very rarely listen to again. Um, it's very, it, it has a very interesting recording though, because one, he's playing fucking acoustic, which I feel like I don't really hear that much, at least not from pop punk or him. Uh, I feel like the mic was strangely far away from his face. It and sounded like he was hell. Yeah, it sounded almost like it was recorded li- like like in a live setting with like 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 a band live kind of thing, not like in a studio. Um, which was very interesting. I I feel like I would. This is one of those songs that I'd like more background on because it's interesting to me, but it's not necessarily something I like. It's also funny that um. Now, Soupy even has fucking Easter eggs about the same album that this song is on. And the first thing I know about The Devil in Your Bloodstream, he's, he's referencing the same album this is on. Oh, I love it. Right, right after I said the album was being consistent and that there wasn't anything bad about it up until this point, of course it's the next song immediately after I say that. It's the acoustic song. This, acoustic song, very questionable vocal recording. Like, why? Why does it sound like it was recorded live? I have many questions that I that I will not get the answers to, and I'm mad. Uh, but yeah, I, this is the only bad song on the album, and there's only two more to go. I, I guess that's, that's doing pretty good if the one bad song is near the end. All right, track number 12, Cul-de-Sac. Another fucking 20 second guitar sustain note <laughs> outro. I'm tired of this. Uh, so, um, this song gets kind of personal for me, and the idea that, like, it, it's very, very cut and dry, not a lot of symbolism. It's a message to a, a now former friend that he doesn't have the strength to continue as this friend is going through addiction that's, that's weighing Soupy down, right? And and I think that's a, a big bold ba- powerful message. Like I think it's being super emotionally in tune, which I I think is relatively mature for somebody who's Soupy's age at twenty six at this point, right? Um, but the, the the first time that I saw them play this song live was fall of twenty fourteen, about a year and a half after this album had come out, and they had kind of adapted the meaning uh, to these issues, kind of being more in touch with with less fortunate people right in people in underprivileged communities people of color people like and uh i i think it it drives home the message even more so that like he had already let go of this friend that he could adapt the meaning to be more meaningful to other people um this song's it it, it, it's a really good song as it is right uh and even when it came out i enjoyed it a lot but like over time the more i listen to it the more impactful it is like i think about the different meanings that it's had to just the band themselves um and and i think it makes it that much better for me i i think this is one of the stronger tracks in the albums but it's it's certainly just as poignant and powerful as even the more personal songs earlier on in the album. Uh, uh, Ted, fuck you, just real quick. Um, okay. Because uh, this was another fucking... Uh, you didn't give me a warning this one's going to be fucking emotional too, you asshole. <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> I thought it was personal. <laughs> um, but no, this is, this is a really good song. Um, I, I love his, like... The the letting go, I don't know, it just it's when Soupy sings it, it just sounds so visceral almost. Um Yeah, I don't I don't have much else to, to add to it, Ted. You pretty much covered all that. Um Yeah, aside from the, the one little one little detour here, we're kinda back to business as usual. Uh kinda consistent with the, the rest of the album. It's just the kind of weird, like acoustic one in there. Um another solid song. Um, but yeah, like it, it it's kind of, I don't know, concerning that like a majority of the songs kind of end the same way. Like really, you couldn't have come up with more creative than just 20 second guitar ring out. Like, come on. The, the, the rest of the album is great, except for you guys just don't know how to end a song. Apparently it's fine it, to do it once, maybe twice. Stop doing it yeah. like 10 times. 
Anyway, yeah, I was gonna say I think every single one had a fucking guitar note outro. This next song is seven and a half minutes. Ted, I swear to God, if this is just like um, if there's a solid minute of just guitar tone at the end, I might okay. lose my mind. It's it's like forty seconds. No, uh, it's, it's super uh. long, but also it's not just guitar ring out; it's guitar ring out plus reverb. Oh, oh boy! <laughs> oh man, That's some good shit. All right, final track number thirteen. I just want to sell out my funeral. I, I kind of like this as an ending to the album. There's the idea that I, I want to matter. I want people to love and care about me. Uh, I I think the ending, like the very last verse to end the song is super poignant. Um, and it, it's very self-reflective, but there's a whole lot of self-indulgence to this song. The rest of this album was so good. Let's include all of the songs again in one more track and just do all of the tracks a second time. And... I think it kind of takes away from how like strong the message of this song could be. It also makes it sort of drag a little and makes you realize how similar the rest of the album is kind of to itself that they can just kind of include six other tracks inside this track and you could probably go through it mostly unnoticed. Um, I think it's a good end to the album, but uh, like I said, super self-indulgent. Um. I, I I like the song. It's it's it is a good end to the end to an album. Um, yeah, I I thought I honestly did think the the constant interpolations were actually pretty interesting. I feel like I don't really see that too too often where bands put multiple verses from other songs in one song. Like I feel like it's probably been done before, but I feel like I do not see this to any capacity. Um. God, dude. they also, I feel like, picked the most, like, some of the most poignant lines from some of those. Um, yeah, this is this is a good song, good end to a good album. I just wish they'd stop ending the shit with a fucking 40 second guitar note, please. I, I feel like doing it for like 30 seconds was like a fuck you because I they had to have realized like people were probably getting sick of it. So just one final fuck you make it 30 <laughs> seconds long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I really like this as an ending. I I've never seen like any album where it's had a song not just interpolate one song off the album, but more than two. Um, I actually really like like that it that it did that. Um, yeah. What a, what a way to what a way to end the album. Um, aside from that one song, like this is really good. Um, oh boy. Okay. Um, I have to pull up. I have not made a list. I, I guess we can try to, oh, I don't have that. Okay. Uh, that's fine. We'll just go here. I can and, run it if you want to buy time. Um, <laughs> no, nah, it's fine. Okay. So we're, okay. we're this many in. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think I'm going to have a hard time ranking these. Um, I definitely know which one's last and which one's at the top, but the other two, um, I feel like are kind of interchangeable because I don't remember them and I don't know. I know for me, uh, the greatest generation is easily my favorite of the four. Um, I think just quality wise sets it apart from the other three albums. Um, but also I think it sticks to its message. I think for the most part, the songs are approachable. It's one coherent thought through the whole album and never really loses track of itself. Uh, like, even as much as I dislike Madeline, right? Like, I still think it fits what the album was going for. Like, it's one solid idea from beginning to end with multiple definitions of the same thing. Um, and, and I think that that adds a lot of value. Um, there are certainly songs in this album that I will come back to. Um passing through a screen door being first and foremost chaser cul-de-sac even sell out my funeral right like even that one i will i will return to on occasion because it kind of gets me out of listening to the whole album at once i can just listen to eight minutes and it's fine um but 
yeah, no, I I very much appreciate this album. I th- I think it is pretty clearly number one for me. Uh, and then everything else just works in reverse order. I think Suburbia is better than The Upsides, and then of course Get Stoked on it is <laughs> miles apart. Last what Get Stoked isn't your favorite album? What <laughs> I f- I feel like it should just be its own category separately at the bottom. It's like if you're doing the tier list, <laughs> like just meme yeah. on it and make a meme category where like the bottom one is Get Stoked on it. Uh huh. Yeah, S A B C D. Fifty feet of shit get stoked on it. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I I go in the same way as Ted. It's uh, Greatest Generation, and then just going backwards. Suburbia, the upsides, and get stoked on it. Um, yeah, Greatest Generation had a really good concept. Honestly, it had so many great moments of guitar work, drum work, percussion work. There were instruments that i don't typically hear in pop punk there were fucking pianos like loud ass fucking bass drums there were i swear to god it sounded like a child's like xylophone at some point um very very interesting it does a lot of things that i haven't seen or heard a lot or ever um so yeah this is really good i also want to note that i went through really quickly and and uh, listened 10 out of 13 songs have a guitar note at the end that expands for at least five seconds. So there, there, Madeline, and which was the third one that didn't? I'm trying to figure it out because it's going to bother me. <laughs> um, I think it was... I, I can't... I'd have to find it again. But yeah, no, in three of them that do not have a guitar tone or reverb at the end. Jeez. That's, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting decision there. But uh, yeah, love this album. Yeah, uh, I, I hate to cop out and just parrot the both of you but uh until i remember what the other two albums sounded like i'm going to placeholder have my rating be the same for now uh start uh, but before we do the next episode i'm gonna very quickly try to like skim through the other two so i can remember how they sounded and then i'll get back to you with my actual rating uh, I have nothing else to really kind of talk about other than that, uh, as of recording this, th- uh, the next week I'm, I'm, yeah, let me check the next week. I'm going to have to, oh wait, no, 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 no. It's not this week. It's the week after that. So yeah, we're, we're good to record the next week, but not the week after. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Never mind. Cool. Disregard. Um, I haven't seen any shows lately. Uh, I am seeing Tool, not this weekend, but next weekend. So very excited for that. Um, and then I'm also finally going home. So cool to return to the snow and the desert and the void. Huh. Array internet being back to normal. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, but if you guys got nothing, then we can wrap up and it here. Alrighty then. Uh, catch y'all next time. See you. Yep.